So um, give them praise and glory. That's what I'm talking about. For this beautiful day, for this is the day the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Um, mm. Um, Bill has asked us to open up in prayer. Um, I have some things I want to share with the Lord's put on my heart this morning real quick. Um, and first, I want to start with, thank you, um, Isaiah 54, and I'm going to read a couple of verses. For the mountains shall, for when the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not be departed from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed from you, says the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near and let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to yod heh vav -Heh, and he will have mercy on him and to our Elohim, for he will abundantly pardon. And so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth and it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing which I sent it to. And so what the Lord has spoken to me today for all of you and what I feel he's trying to say is we've all been through a lot and we're all going through a lot. There's been a lot of turmoil. There's been a lot of trials. There's been wilderness experiences. We have gone through the gauntlet and still going through the gauntlet. In John 14, 27, he says, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Peace be still. And that's the word, peace be still. Those who keep their eyes stayed on me, I shall keep them in perfect peace. And that's the word he is speaking. Peace be still regardless of the storm. Do not lose faith or be faint hearted. For blessed be the name of the Lord. For his glory is and mercies are new every morning. May the mercies of David accompany you each and every moment of the day. And keep your eyes fixed on him. And blessed be the Father of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, the Messiah, who has comforted us in all of our afflictions, that we may comfort those in their afflictions, that they may see the glory of God for the word which reigns and rules in our heart, that his glory may be revealed, and that we may be a sweet-smelling aroma on the altar of righteousness of the God of heaven and earth. Be that, and that's the word I, I hear in my heart today for everyone to be that sweet-smelling aroma, to be children of lights and imitators of God and walk in the light as he is in the light. Do not faint, do not fear, do not be removed, but instead stand. No retreat and no surrender. Amen? <laughs> All right. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Your goodness and mercies are new to us each and every morning. Father in heaven, I pray for all who are here for healing, for peace, for restoration, rest restoration of our soul, spirits, renewal of our minds and our hearts, Lord. Even for those watching, may they be healed and restored. May they receive the confidence of faith, the substance of faith hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For we will not fall we will not be moved but we shall stand we shall stand by the word which rules and reigns in our heart we shall stand by the holy spirit which you have given us as a guarantee we shall stand arm to arm with one another in the fellowship of the spirit and we shall continue to stand thank you father for this day may your holy spirit fill us and may the ruling and the reign of the king of kings and the lord of lords be within us through us and and all around us for the kingdom of God is within you. Amen. Motto, oh,
Understand that this shofar is not just a horn. It is the voice of God. And there has been healing when people you know, blow the shofars. And if you have that faith and you're struggling physically or emotionally, whatever that might be, receive when you hear that horn, know that it's the voice of God blowing. And receive it as a healing if you need that. Gentlemen. Shabbat 
You can handle it, right? All right, all right. About face. You got to turn around now in the opposite direction. Here we go. You ready? Just make sure you're catching your breath here before we get going here. Behold how good and how 
pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together. Kine mato humanai, chevete kingamiaka. Kine mato humanai, chevete kingamiaka. Chevete kingamiaka. Chevete kingamiaka. You guys look great. I don't know about you guys, but I've been excited to get to this day <laughs> all week. I've been excited to get here. And the, the tour portion is one of my favorite ones where we get a chance to come and ask him, let me see your face. I wanna see your glory. That's what I want. I wanna be in a place where I can stand and see his face and watch him pour out his spirit in this place. That's where we're asking to be today. Are you in a place where you're ready for that? Ready or not, here it comes. <laughs>
off our lives that are not pleasing to you. Oh, Papa, what else matters in this world than to serve you? What is more wonderful than to serve you, to be called a child of you, 
a servant, to be an instrument for you, to be a voice, a hand, a kindness, a kind word, a hug, a look, a walk, a light. Be those things for him. Allow him to fill you. Allow him to use you. It's never too late. It is never too late to be used of the King. For He has chosen the weak things of this world to confound the wise. If you are weak and you say you have nothing to offer, He's looking for you. He is looking for you. He desires you. Oh, there's someone in here. I think you're in the live stream. And you're saying you don't know if you believe all this. But this is what the Lord is telling me and saying to you. You have a conscience. When He created you, He gave man all those things and He gave you a conscience. Though you don't know Him, you don't have that relationship with Him. Something inside of you is telling you that something is right and there's a wrong. And it is Him. He had placed that in your life and all of us. He wants to guide you and that conscience is guiding you towards Him. There is a God in heaven. And what you're experiencing right now is His presence. Just say, I receive it. Forget of what your mind is saying. Just tell Him, thank you. And believe what He is telling you. Believe what you're sensing. Oh, 
Moses stood on a mountain, waiting for you to pass by. You put your hand over his face, so in your presence he wouldn't die. And all.
can just see your face Oh, I know I will make it to the end If I can just see And make it to the end If I can just see your face Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known. Reveal the glory of the living God. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known. Reveal the glory. Let the weight of your glory fall. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known. Reveal the glory. We 
tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. In your presence.
Father, may we honor you in how we interact with one another, Father. May you be glorified today, Father, in every day of our lives. May what we're experiencing here, Father, we take it to our homes, to our spouses, Father, to our, our family, our children, our neighbors, Father, those around us, Father. For you filling us, Father, for a purpose, to do thy will. And Father, let thy will be done in our lives, Father. Thank you, Papa. Prepare our hearts, Father, to receive your word, Father. Our hearts are open, ears are wide, and ready to learn of you, Father. Teach us, Papa. Correct us what you have to, Father. Here we are. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Let's just everybody remain standing. And if you will, bring up the liturgy, please. Say this with me. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. In Mark 12 it says that one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he, Yeshua, had answered them well, asked him, What is the most important commandment? And Yeshua answered him, The first of all the commandments is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Gentlemen. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Ladies Shema Israel Everyone now. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem The Lord is one. Blessed be his name and his glorious kingdom forever. 
Stands a whole lot. Love your neighbor, love your God. They are hapta, they are hapta. Et Adonai Elohecha, bechol evacha, ubechol nafshecha, ubechol meodecha, and you shall love the Lord your God. Take a moment and shake someone's hand, hug their neck if it's appropriate, bump fist. All righty, so we have our hoopah set up. Let's get all of our itty bitties gathered under the hoopah. You're messing with me. You're messing. Alrighty, if you're at home and your children are there, gather them close to you. And for all of us, those of our children who are not here, in our hearts, we're going to put them under the hoopah, our treasure box over here. So now, who feels like pronouncing a blessing over your children and grandchildren? I don't mean you're just going to go through the motions. Who's ready to pronounce a blessing upon their children? A handful of you are. So let's all stand, all of those, all of those who can. Let's stand, please, and let's extend our hands toward our children. 
you out there, you extend your hands towards your children, these children, and we just ask the Father to take his hand and put it over all of our children, wherever they are, whatever they're doing, wherever they've traveled and journey, whatever situation they are in, we just pray that he will take his hand and put it on them. And you know, I hadn't said this in a while, but let me say it again. We pray, as we, play, as we pronounce this blessing upon our children, we pray for all of our children and grandchildren who are not walking the way they should, that he would just take his hand and get in their life and just stir it up, mess it all up, turn it upside down, give them fits, give them fits, give them fits until they come to him. Whether or not they come back to us is another thing. What's most important is they come back to him. Isn't that right? If you believe that, let's pronounce this blessing on our children. May the Lord protect and defend you. May he always shield you from shame. And may you come to be in Israel a shining name. May you be like Ruth. And like David, may you be deserving of praise. Fainten them, O oh Lord, and keep them from the stranger's ways. And may God bless you and grant you long life. And defend you. May the Lord preserve you from pain. Favor them, O oh Lord, with happiness and peace. Oh, hear our Sabbath you've given us we thank you especially for these children and we father we pray that you would bless them watch over them keep them strong and we lift them up to you in Yeshua's name amen thank you you may return to your seats thank you gentlemen Celso, where are you and Heather going? Y'all didn't hear me say hang on just a minute? Y'all may have to help me sing a song. Not, maybe not. Wally doesn't know it either. I don't know if Shauna knows it. I don't know if anybody knows it but me. But I was singing it all the way here. Huh? Tell me what key they say. Should be a minor. Through our God, we shall do valiantly. It is He who will tread down the enemy. We'll sing and shout the victory. Yeshua.
shall tread down the enemy. We'll sing and shout the victory. Yeshua is king for our God has won the victory and set his people free. His word has slain the shall tread down the enemy will sing and shout the victory Yeshua is king for God has won the victory and set his people free his word has slain the enemy so the earth shall stand and see that our God, we shall do valiantly. It is He who shall tread down the enemy. We will sing and shout the victory. Yeshua is King. One more time, for our God has won the victory and set His people free. His word has slain the enemy. The earth shall stand and see that through our God we shall do thou with thee, cause it is he who will tread down the enemy, will sing and shout the victory. Yeshua is king, Yeshua is king, Yeshua. Do you believe it? Because if you don't believe it, we need to sing it some more. Now wave your hand. Is Lena ready? Is she ready to dance? Is she stomping? <laughs> She's rubbing her belly right now. For God has won the victory and set his people free his word has slain the enemy and the earth shall stand and see that through our god we shall do valiantly for it is he who will tread down the enemy will sing and shout the victory yeshua is Set his people free, and his word shall slay the enemy, and the earth shall stand and see that through our God we shall do valiantly, for it is he who will tread down the enemy, he will sing and shout the victory. Yeshua is king, Yeshua. Amen. 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 You can be seated if you want to. If you don't want to, you want to march around. It's kind of feeling like one of those moments. What's that verse? Out of the mouths and of babes and suckling, you have perfected praise. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Shabbat shalom. How is everyone doing this morning? Well, good. Very good. I'm going to need to borrow. Actually, no, 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 no. Just, just don't worry about it. 
what? He thinks I need candy? Oh, you know. <laughs> well, I don't know that I could take any candy right now, but it, you go right ahead, Joffrey, if you'd like. All right. Um, first of all, I just want to, uh, before we proceed, where's Nayla? How are you? You're okay? She's in pain. And yet she come to teach the treasures. I don't know whether to hug your neck or shame you. I'm not sure which, but she and Robert and Zuriel were in a, a little fender bender yesterday, and they got rear-ended and had to go to the hospital. Robert's at home watching, and uh, is, where's is Zuriel here at home? Is there, there's Zuriel, or Haman, but, but the best... But the best Haman, no, 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 no. But no, he did a great Haman. If there ever was a Haman who needed to be applauded, it was you, Zuriel. But anyway, we just want to keep them in our prayers because they they're a little stove up and you came anyway. So bless your heart. And I meant that in the good way. All right. All right. And I saw a strange man walking around. There he is right there. You see that man right there? Yeah. I walked up and I'm like, who is that next to Melissa? Anyway. Well, good morning, everybody. Shabbat shalom or good afternoon at this point. I'm glad you're in a good mood. Here we go. <laughs> All right, our tour portion today, Kitisa. And it begins in Exodus chapter 30, verse 11. And I'm, uh, excuse me, that's not right. Yeah, it is. That is correct? Yeah, I guess that would be right, huh? All right, well, I must have put something wrong in my notes before I mess up here. Hang on just a moment. Is that right? Okay, all right. I'm in the twilight zone here for a moment. All right, so anyway, I'm going to begin to read. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, yes, that's it. When you take the census of the children of Israel for their number, then every man shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord when you number them, that there may be no plague among you when you number them. This is what everyone among those who are numbered shall give, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 gira. The half shekel shall be an offering to the Lord. The reference is wrong, but the verse is right. Thank you. All right. I had the reference wrong in my notes. Is that what you're saying? Speak to me. Yes. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure before I get going here. So let's start over. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, when you take the census of the children of Israel for their number, then every man shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord when you number them, that there may be no plague among you or among them when you number them. This is what everyone among you who is numbered shall give, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The half shekel shall be an offering unto the Lord. And so the word, or the words, kitisa, is the name of the portion when you uh, take a census. But the word tisa, this is the word we're going to kind of emphasize, or the root word we're going to emphasize throughout the duration of the message today. That word tisa comes from the root word nasa, nasa, which is nun, sheen, or seen. Aleph. Can we show that? Thank you. Nun, Shin, in this case, Asin, Aleph, Nasa. And it means to lift up, to raise up, or to exalt. Now, in regard to a ransom. And in regard to that ransom, there are three times this, this particular word, not Nasa, but the word for ransom, three times that this word is translated in this way. So we're talking about the word nasa means to lift up, to raise, to exalt, translated as census. And then there's the word for ransom that is used three times to refer to someone who is guilty of taking human life, but it's not murder. In other words, a soldier. 
because sometimes war is a necessary evil, right? So in this particular case, the ransom is paid before the battle. The ransom is given so that there shall be no plague among them. And that is believed to be, at least in some rabbinical writings, that that is referring to the fact that when this ransom is paid, it, that there will be no slaughter in battle. Another translation renders it, when this ransom is paid, it's so that they will not suffer defeat in battle. So the half shekel is given to the sanctuary according to the heads that are counted, so to speak. And this ransom, that's the word that's used here, is given to support the sanctuary so that when they have to go to war, there will be no slaughter in battle. Did you follow that? So in, it's saying here that the census was indirectly at least connected to a soldier going into battle. And so by supporting God's purpose, it is insinuated that they would be protected in battle. In other words, if the Lord is for us, who can be against us? It's not really important that we find out if the Lord is on our side. What's really important is for us to be on the Lord's side, right? So that when we are supporting his purpose, his agenda, his cause, his will, that when we have to go into battle, because there are going to be times that we're going to have to fight. Isn't that right, Joffrey? That's right. All right. And so it's in supporting his purpose, it's tied to protection in battle, or at least that's insinuated. So the census was intended to number them in regard to the contributing of the half shekel, which is to say the upkeep of the sanctuary. They're supporting the sanctuary, thereby they're expressing support for God's purpose and for his will. But in other words, more than just monetarily, what we're talking about here is counting the heads of those who are willing to fight for the kingdom of heaven, to advance the purpose of our God. Through our God, we shall do valiantly, right? But yet, we still have to do something. We have to be on his side. The phrase, when you take the senses, the Hebrew phrasing, is literally rendered, when you elevate the heads. We've discussed this in previous years. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that particular point except to say that everyone was uh, to give to the sacred cause. And when everyone who was eligible, everyone who was required, when they gave and contributed to a sacred cause, all of that elevated the whole nation. It's kind of like the old saying of a rising tide lifts all boats. So when everybody was doing according to God's purpose, playing their part in everything that God wanted to do, then the whole nation was going to be elevated, as it were. Everyone was going to benefit. Everybody had a role to play. Some had specific roles to play. He gifted some with wisdom, people like Bezalel and Oholiab, to fashion the different furnishings and the utensils and things like that. Yet everyone had a role to play. And when that happened, according to God's purpose, the entire nation was elevated, as it were, lifted up. It, everybody benefited from that. And so the ideal was to elevate God's purpose above all other purposes so that everyone benefited. That's the ideal. And that works when everybody's on the same sheet of music. However, there's always been those who marched to a different drum. There have always been those who have their own purpose, their own agenda in mind. They have their own plan. And some people t sometimes get into the, to borrow from George Harrison, the I, me, me, mine attitude. The older folks know exactly what I'm saying. The young folks have no idea what I'm talking about. But when we get into the I, me, me, mine mindset, what happens then, it lowers all boats rather than elevating them. And if we keep lowering them enough, eventually a lot of boats are going to get grounded. And they're not going to be able to do what they're supposed to do. That mindset follows the mindset of the adversary who said this in Isaiah 14. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mound of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Now, the prophet says, well, that's not going to really happen. 
Lucifer is what he's called. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to fall from heaven. You're going to be cut down to the ground. Because we know that everyone who exalts themselves, what happens? They're going to be humbled. But everyone who humbles themselves, what happens? They'll be lifted up. But we're going to talk about those who lift up themselves for their own purpose and agenda as opposed to those who lift up their heads to be counted to serve God's purpose. And so in this vein of thought, it connects us to another meaning of this word nasa, nun, sin, aleph. And that meaning is deception. A derivative of this word is used to describe what happened to Eve. She said, the serpent deceived or beguiled me. And he did so with very smooth words. The word for deceive or beguiled is from this very same root word that is used here in Kitisa. And of course, being deceived and beguiled, that led her to make faulty conclusions. Those faulty conclusions resulted in rebellion. She ate the fruit, then she turned to her husband, he ate the fruit, and because of that, man fell. And so nasa, not only does it mean to lift up, as in lift up your head, it also is tied to the idea of deception, is tied to the idea of rebellion. In fact, the Aramaic equivalent of this word, Aramaic is a sister language to Hebrew, the Aramaic equivalent of this word means to rise up in rebellion, to stand against or resist authority or controls. In other words, people lift up their head in rebellion. An example is in Psalm 83, verse 1. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace. And do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, an uproar. That word can also be translated growling. You know, like a lion sometimes or something like that. They make a tumult. They're making a growl. And those who hate you have lifted up their head. Nasa. They are lifting up their head to do what? To growl, to make a tumult, to make an uproar. They have taken crafty or secret counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. So as we begin, the point that I'm making here is either by decision or by default we are going to lift up our heads to be counted as soldiers for one of two masters, either the Almighty or the adversary. And, of course, most who choose the latter by decision or by default would never concede that they're serving the adversary. But they're, if they're not serving the Almighty, if we're not serving the Almighty, then who are we ser are serving? We're serving ourselves, and we might as well go ahead and say the adversary. So I'm going to say this again. By decision or by default, we will lift up our heads to be counted as servants for one of two masters, the creator of all things or the accuser of the brethren. We're going to serve one or the other. And in service to one or the other, we are going to advance their purpose. We're going to advance their kingdom. Somebody is going to be our leader. In fact, the word for prince in Hebrew comes from the same root word, nasi. Somebody's going to be our prince. Somebody's going to lead us. Somebody's going to tell us what to do, and then we're going to do that. It's either going to be the Messiah or it's going to be self. And again, if it's self, you might as well say it's the adversary. And so, to that point, we need to backtrack just a little bit to Exodus 20. Exodus 20, verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So that's the first of the commandments, that I am the Lord your God. I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. And because I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt, don't make any other gods. Don't worship anything else. Don't bow down to anything else. And to this instruction, the people of Israel said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. 
How did that turn out? All that the Lord has spoken, we're going to do that. Yes, amen, hallelujah. We're going to sing and shout and do the victory, and we're going to praise God, hallelujah, amen, amen, amen. But as soon as things didn't go their way, they raised up their heads to rebel. Exodus 32. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together unto Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So they had previously, and not too long before this, acknowledged that the Lord was God. Now they want other gods. So in a very short time, the people of God had corrupted themselves. Verse 8 of chapter 32. Here's what the Lord says. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So I want us to think about this. We were singing this morning about we want to see his face. We want to experience the glory of God. Now, I'm of the view, this is Bill's opinion, I'm of the view that if God showed up in here the way he did at Mount Sinai, nobody would have to tell you. No one would have to convince you or anything like that. Because here's what would happen. Everybody would be flat on their face. That's what would happen. Now, we want the glory of the Almighty to visit us. We want his presence to be with us. And the more, if the weight of his glory is going to continue to fall upon us, here's what that means. Flesh has to get out of the way because no flesh shall glory in my presence. More and more, it's like a, that press, you know, the olive press coming down on those olives. That's the weight of his glory. More and more of us has to give way to his glory and his presence. That's the way it works. And I'm going to suggest to you, and I'm saying this, believing this in the spirit, that there's more people who want his presence and his glory to continue to visit us in greater measure than those who don't. And because of that, those who don't had better get with the program or get out of the way. Who said amen? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that. I have ghost bumps right now saying that. Oh, Bill thinks he's all hoity toity. No, 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 no. No, I know Bill. <laughs> I'm well acquainted with Bill. I see Bill every morning in the mirror in all his pasty white glory. <laughs> Filter, Beth says. But do we want his presence? Do we really want his presence? It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to do what has to be done so that his glory can abide with us in a greater measure. So here's what we learn from the children of Israel, that even after experiencing the glory of God in the way that they did, people can quickly turn to other things and quickly bring destruction upon themselves. I do not think it's an accident that the incident of the golden calf is written in Genesis, excuse me, Exodus chapter 32, because if you were looking in a Hebrew Bible, the 32 would be written Lamed Beit. Lamid Beit. Can we show that, please? If you know a little Hebrew, you know that that's the word lev or heart. Because you see what happens when the pressure is on, when the weight is coming down. We're gonna, whatever's on the inside is going to come outside, right? You're going to see what's on the inside when the weight of his glory is coming down. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In this day and age, out of the abundance of the heart, they post comments. <laughs> we say things. We post things. We make these comments. 
Because out of the abundance of the heart, this happens. The writer of Hebrews says this of the children of Israel. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 20, they could not endure what was commanded. They could not handle it. And so when the pressure is on, we're going to truly see what's in our hearts. In this particular case, the waiting got to them. They couldn't handle it. They had to do something. We're, we're getting fidgety. We've got to make something happen. Let's do something, even if it's wrong. And they did. They did something, and it was incredibly wrong. They had to make a God that they could see and understand, this invisible God that we can't see. We can't really understand what he's asking us to do. It seems like a big mystery. We got to have something that we can see and understand. They had to put a recognizable face on it so that it could go before them. And in so doing, they broke their word to God. They went back on what they said. I don't want to have to stand before the Almighty and hear him say, you're a liar. Nobody wants to hear that. But the reality is, there will be people, he will say, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. I don't recognize you. Now, there's an argument that these people weren't really worshiping an idol of Egypt as much as they were adapting what they knew from Egypt to visibly represent the God of Israel. In other words, here's how I boil it down, they committed rebellion in the name of yod heh How can someone do that? Read your scripture. It's throughout the scripture. People say we're going to do this in the name of the Lord. What did Samuel tell Saul? Excuse me, Saul tells Samuel. All these bleeding sheep, I, I saved all this for the Lord. But what did the Lord tell you, Saul? Obedience is better than sacrifice, right? So there are many instances where people commit rebellion in the name of yod heh vav You know, they, I called it holy camouflage. They're, they're wearing this camouflage that says I'm holy, but it's intended to bury something else and conceal something else. And so in this idea that they weren't really worshiping an Egyptian idol as much as just taking something to represent the God of Israel, here's what one rabbinic commentary states. The people did not intend to give up their allegiance to God. They did not intend to do that. That wasn't our intention. That's, what, that's not what we really meant to happen out of all of this. What we intended was this. But there again, there's that Old saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? <laughs> they did not intend to give up their allegiance to God. They desired a visible symbolic representation of the God who brought them out of Egypt. All right, so whatever the motivation, whatever their motivation was, they mingled holy with profane. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is an act of rebellion. They broke off their earrings to have Aaron fashion a golden calf. Interestingly, the laws of the bondservant, of the Evid, what happens? He goes to the doorpost of his master. His ear is set there, and they bore a hole through his ear to do what? To put a ring in his ear. And the ring was to signify his dedication to his master. Here the people are taking off their earrings. They're contributing to the building of an Egyptian icon. In other words, symbolically saying, this is our God. This is our master. And so as the Almighty is graving the tablets on Mount Sinai, Aaron is graving an idol upon whose completion the people said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Centuries later, Jeroboam is going to say the same thing. In fact, he's going to just double down. He's going to have altars and calves set up in Dan and Bethel. And he's going to say, these are your gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. That's in 1 Kings 12, if you want to read it. You know why he did that? The old green monster. Jealousy. I don't want my people going down to Jerusalem because that, they might like what they see there and join themselves to the house of David. That's why he did. That was his motivation to set up altars and golden idols for the people and to lead them into rebellion 
It was born out of jealousy. So again, here's an example of rebellion in the name of yud heh vav Now, we can't escape the fact that Aaron calls for a feast unto yud heh vav underscoring the notion, at least as far as I'm concerned, that this was at least in part the mixing of holy and profane. And we can't escape the fact that Aaron helps to lead in this rebellion, or at least he stands aside and allows for this to happen, right? I mean, he did participate, didn't he? In a very tremendous way. There are some rabbis who try to put a nice little face on it and say, well, the reason that Aaron did this is because he was a lover of peace. He was a peacemaker. There is a tradition that her, you know, the, the guy who along with Aaron had been holding Moses' hands up or his arms up. There's a tradition that this mob, when they were getting restless, they rose up and her tried to resist them and they killed him. And when Aaron saw this, he said, ooh, I better take a different tactic here. And so they say because he was trying to, you know, make, you know, kind of buy time, he was going to try to keep the peace. And that's why he did this. All right, that's a tradition, it's a legend. I don't know if it happened exactly that way, but let's just say that it did. Even if it's true, the outcome demonstrates that we cannot acquiesce to mob mentality. Just because the mob is rising up and lifting up their heads in rebellion doesn't mean that we're supposed to back down. Now, the way we fight, we don't fight <laughs> conventionally. Our warfare isn't carnal. And so, a lot of times, this is how I feel anyway, I feel like our war, the, the way God has us fight, his, um, uh, what's, what's the, rules of engagement. I think some of the military men understand what that is, right? There's rules of engagement. There are things that have to happen before you're allowed to do certain things. Would that be correct? Okay. And unless those things happen, you can't do this. You have to kind of restrain yourself. Is that correct? Okay, so here's how I feel like God says what his rules of engagement are where we're fighting most of the time. With both hands tied behind your back and duct tape across your mouth. Well, that's kind of how it is a lot of times. However, he's fighting for us. But just because we may have both hands tied behind our back and he's got duct tape across our mouth doesn't mean we have to retreat. It doesn't mean we have to concede ground. Through our God, we shall do valiantly. Amen? Amen. So, we don't acquiesce to mob mentality. We don't acquiesce to the trends of culture. We don't acquiesce to what's popular in society. And the fact that Levi, or the tribe of Levi, was sent through the camp after Moses' return to destroy the guilty emphasizes that. Moses said, no, we're not going to put up with this. You know, the meekest man alive said, we're not going to put up with this nonsense. Now, maybe Aaron was compassionate. Maybe, maybe he was a soft-hearted man who wanted peace above all else. Oh, peace, we just want peace. Lord knows we want peace. However, maybe it's a little more than that because we have to understand to attain true peace, sometimes we have to be willing to go to war. If the allies weren't ready and had the stomach to go to war against the Axis, what happens? Some, <laughs> somebody said we'd be speaking German right now or Japanese. No offense to the Germans or, or any Japanese. Point is, to have true peace, we have to be at times willing to go to war. And so if Aaron's motivation was peace, I'm going to suggest to you is this. He, was, he just wanted everybody to be able to hold on to their warm fuzzies and be content. Now, Aaron's wanting everybody to have their warm fuzzies. They don't want anybody to be unhappy. Let's all just get along. Can't we just get along? What was Moses' reaction to that? And what actions did Moses take? Exodus 32, verse 21. What did this people do to you 
speaking to Aaron, that you have brought so great a sin upon them. Now, I just want that to percolate for just a moment. Moses is coming down to his brother and said, what did these people do to you? What did you let them do to you that you would bring this sin on them? That sounds like a rebuke to me. Moses was hot. In fact, that's the way the Bible reads. His anger was hot. And Aaron was saying, please don't be so hot at me. You know what? Moses was hot. He was angry. What did you do? What did these people do that you would bring this sin on them? Go down to verse 25. Now, when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them, to their shame among their enemies... Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. So rather than being commended for making peace, Aaron was chastised for not restraining the people. Maybe it was because he was fearful of what might happen if he did restrain them. That means this. We cannot let fear of what others may think or do immobilize us. Amen. People are going to think what they're going to think. They're going to do what they're going to do. They're going to say what they're going to say. But that should not stop you and me from doing what we know according to the word is right. If we are placed in a decision where we have to choose whether we're going to offend God or offend man, then let men and women be offended. But we need to understand people don't like their warm fuzzies messed with. Don't mess with their warm fuzzies because they'll get mad, they'll get sad, sometimes they'll get vengeful. And people will go to great lengths to put their warm fuzzies back in place. They don't want you messing with them. Because that's really, I'm going to use this phrase, a sacred cow. Don't mess with my sacred cow. Don't mess with my warm fuzzies. My little life here that's all in place. We just prayed for our children that aren't walking right, that God would go in, take his hand, and mess their whole life up. Stir it up. That, you know what that means? Mess with their warm fuzzies. Mess them all up. Because you see, if we are truly to die to ourselves, then the warm fuzzies are probably going to be a victim to the sword of the Spirit. Because warm fuzzies soothe what? Flesh. All that kind of stuff. So I want to say this again. We cannot let the fear of what people may think, say, do, etc. keep us from doing what's right, saying what's right, standing for what's right. I know that everybody likes the compassionate, forgiving, and long-suffering God. Everybody likes him. Most people don't care too much for the God who has to administer justice. He's less popular. Remember God went to Cain when his countenance was all downcast? Because first of all, he had not done what he was supposed to do. Abel knew it. How did Abel know to do what's right and Cain didn't? They they had the same mom and dad. You're going to tell me that Adam didn't teach Cain but taught Abel? Doubt it. Not likely. In fact, God says, Cain, you know what's right. Just do the right thing. And so God tells him to do the right thing or else Cain sins waiting right at the door. You don't do the right thing. If you don't serve me, you're going to serve sin. We are going to raise up our head to be counted as soldiers for one of two masters. And he's telling Cain, if you walk out that door to do, not to do right, sin is going to pounce on you. And so what happened? He lifted his head in rebellion, lured his brother into the field and murdered him, and then turned around and played the victim when his sin was addressed with consequences. And why do I say that? Oh, my punishment is more than I can nasa. It's more than I can bear. Y'all still in a good mood? (laughs) All right. 
None of us, including me, none of us like the consequences that come when we've made bad choices. Nobody likes that. But there's a difference between those who receive it, learn from it, overcome it, and those who take the attitude of Cain, oh, it's just more than I can bear. What's that line in Tombstone? I'm afraid the strain was just more than he could bear. <laughs> Nobody likes the consequences. I want to remind you that 3,000 were put to death at God's command because of the rebellion. We don't like that God. We don't like the one who has to administer justice. We don't like the one who allows us to suffer the consequence of our choices. And there's a lot of angry people out there who blame God and everybody else except themselves for their own choices. There, you know, this world is full of people who like to blame God, some of whom say they don't even believe in God, yet they blame God for all the world's chaos. I mean, that, that don't even make good sense to me. And yet they'll blame God for all the world's chaos, the very chaos that men created. And why? Because men don't like God's boundaries. People don't like God's standards. People don't like God's rules. They don't want it. They've been proving that from day one, and it hasn't changed one lick today. And so as God's people, we are supposed to be those who respect those boundaries, who honor. We may not like them. He didn't say like them. He said do them. <laughs> honor them. Respect them. And why? Because you love me. There it is. Hello. So, yeah, you can clap on that. I feel like I'm coming across as a little preachy, you know. All right. <laughs> as God's people, we are supposed to respect the boundaries that he's established. And so that means, for me anyway, I couldn't care less what woke culture thinks or feels in regard to what is right. I don't care. Could care less. And I won't be intimidated by it. I won't be drug around by it. I'm not going to do that. Listen to this. It is our duty to restrain God's people when they lift up their heads in rebellion. Put yourself in Aaron's place. That is your responsibility, starting in your home. Men, take control of your home. That's why I'm pausing. <laughs> there is a standard, a protocol, an order that God established in the beginning. Men, you love your wives as Yeshua loved his church. Ladies, you respect and honor your husbands as they do that. Don't try to take his place. Now, I know that we got single um, ladies and single men in here. I understand that, okay? So, not talking to you so much right now, but gentlemen, that you have a home, you have a wife, you have children, you need to be, you need to restrain any rebellion that rises up in your house. As God's people, it is our duty to restrain those whose heads rise up in rebellion. Because unrestrained, God's people will bring shame upon themselves before their enemies. That's what Moses said. And that is the worst of it as far as I'm concerned. When God's people play the fool in front of the whole world. We, do, we dishonor our God. That is exactly right. And sometimes wearing 
holy camouflage. Exodus 32, verse 7. Y'all still with me here? Most of you are. Some of you are thinking about it. So be it. Verse 7, and the Lord said to Moses, go get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, that you brought up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and, may make, and that I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation." Now, I read that to ask this question. Why does God say to Moses, your people that you brought up out of the land of Egypt? All right, here's a thought. Maybe God is saying, you know what? I'm putting distance between me and these people. They have ticked me off, and I need to put some distance between me and them, and I understand that perfectly, don't you? <laughs> We've all been there, haven't we? All right? So I get that. Maybe he said, I don't want nothing to do with these people because if I have anything to do with them, I'm going to wipe them out. That's God's word, not mine. On the other hand, and this is what many believe, maybe he was referring to the Arav Rav. It's a Hebrew term that means mixed multitude. There are some who believe that when he says, your people, Moses, that you brought out of Egypt... He's referring to or hinting at the out of Rob, the mixed multitude, because these are the people that it is believed incited Israel to sin. Here with the golden calf, and then later on with the quail and the, and the whole uh, eating flesh thing. In fact, you read it, it was the mixed multitude who began to grumble first, and then they incited the rest of God's people to start grumbling. And so there's, there's always this element that starts the nying, 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 nying. And then people join in. So let me put it this way. These would be, the out of Rob would be the tares in the midst of the wheat. These would be the wolves in sheep's clothing. And if this is accurate, this is the group that Aaron tried to make peace with. If so, the lesson is this. We can never be at peace with tares. Here's why. They are aggressive and they are unrelenting. They don't quit. They don't give up. And their goal is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And I can say that because of the one who sowed the tares in the midst of the wheat. Because that's what he comes to do, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And how does he do it? Usually from the very beginning with smooth words. So then, there comes a day, however, when the tares have to be uprooted. There comes a day when the wolves have to be chased off. How many of you remember back on Inman, and I shared with you a dream I had about a tent and wolves? Does anybody remember that? Raise your hand if you remember that. All right, good number of you. Now, just to kind of bring everybody else up to speed, I, I shared with them, this is probably a year and a half, two years ago. Maybe, no, probably two and a half. Yeah, it's been a while. But I had this, you remember, Jerry. Remember the conversation we had? And in this dream, I was in this tent. And it was dark, and there were these wolves that were just going around this tent. And they were trying to get inside the tent, and they were trying to get to me. And I, you know, I was firing at them and trying to chase them off. And then there were some men who come up, and they were, I saw a face or two. Men in this congregation that I recognize, and they were outside, and they were fighting them off too. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. There comes a day when the tares have to be uprooted. There comes a day when we have to chase the wolves away. Make of that what you will. Where the Arav are concerned, 
these people who it is believed anyway stirred up trouble. There were, there were many in Israel, sadly, who followed their lead, and God says they have quickly turned aside from his commands. And it's, as he said, because they're stiff-necked, which is to say they were like an ox who refused to submit to the yoke. Won't be controlled, won't submit to authority, rebels. And so when faced with this situation, Moses had to make some decisions. Now, he's before God. God's ready to wipe them out. Stand aside. I'm going to wipe them out. I'll raise up a nation from you. And thankfully, he does not do that. What does he say? No, don't do that. What will all their enemies say? What will your enemies say? Spare them. Have mercy on them. So he intercedes on behalf of the whole congregation. Then he comes down the mountain and initiated the destruction of 3,000. How do you reconcile that? Because he was protecting the congregation. Because he was looking out for the congregation. And as harsh as this sounds, cancerous cells breed cancerous cells. And if the body is going to continue on, what has to happen? All right. Let me say something here. Some about what I'm about to say is, is not going to go over well with some, perhaps. From the very beginning, we've said that there need to be boundaries here. Not arbitrary boundaries, but boundaries based on Scripture. Because from the beginning, God established boundaries. He is, he is the one who established the firmament in the heavens to divide the waters above from the waters beneath. He's the one who set a boundary between darkness and light. He is the one who set a boundary when he said to the seas, you'll come this far but no farther. He is the one who establishes boundaries. He is the one who said, These group, this group of people can come into the courtyard. This group can come into the holy place, but only this guy can come into the most holy. He's the one who established all of that. And so boundaries are very biblical. And those boundaries like we see in the sacred space, the garden in Genesis, it has to be guarded. It has to be defended. And you can't let your guard down. You turn your back, and before you know it, there's a different tree growing in your sacred space. And now all of a sudden, you've got to deal with that. So then, those boundaries have to be protected. And those of you who've been around here a long time, you've heard me say this through the years, we're going to do our best to protect those boundaries and to defend them. And I was serious. I was dead serious about it. I still am. Because for better or for worse, God has put Beth and myself here at this point in time to be the shepherds of this congregation. And so as the shepherds of this congregation, our goal is to be counted as those who lift up their heads to support his purpose and his agenda, to fight and to contend for the kingdom of heaven. Amen. That's our goal. That's, that's our vision. And we take it very seriously. And we know that that's not going to be easy. We knew that from the very beginning. But we're going to fight for that. As long as the Father allows me to stand here for us to serve in that capacity, there's a day that he'll say, that your time's done. Okay? But as long as we're in this position, we take that responsibility to restrain and to defend those boundaries very seriously. Amen. And so then, fighting for those things means that at times, there are going to be people who are going to be unhappy about the actions that are taken. Yep. I know that if we do what God has called us to do, that there will be people who will be unhappy about what we have to do. There will be people who will not have the stomach for it. There will be relations lost. There will be friends lost. And that is unfortunate, yes, and sad, and I regret that. But I will not let fear of what people say, think, or do immobilize me from doing what's right. And so... The wolves have to be chased off, and the wolves in sheep's clothing need to be exposed. So here's my prayer from Luke 12. This is what Yeshua said. There is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. 
Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear in inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. May God bring it to pass. I want you to consider what is said to Levi after they went through the camp. Moses says this, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, that he may bestow on you a blessing this day. Why? For every man has opposed his son and his brother. You understand what he's saying to them, right? You understand what's just happened when he says this, right? They have gone through the camp with sword drawn. So I'll read it again. Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord that he may bestow on you a blessing for this day for every man has opposed his son and his brother. To do his will, to really do his will, we may find ourselves at times having to oppose our brother and our friend. Been there, done that, and it would seem that that is what's going to happen from here on out. But Yeshua reminded a group of people one time, he says, who is my mother and brothers and sisters? Those that keep the commandments of my father. Luke 12, verse 51, Yeshua says, do you think I have come to give peace on the earth? A sword. And what does a sword do? It divides. It can discern between soul and spirit. It can also discern between dark and light. And so if he came to bring division, how does that reconcile with a call to unity? Because, Bill, we've heard you talk about unity, unity, unity. Well, here's how it works. Unity of the faith can't coexist with darkness. Unity of the faith can't coexist with rebellion against God. And I want you to understand this, and, and I, I know that there's some people who are getting a little right now. They're getting triggered. I know it. I can see it. But this isn't about showing people here who's boss. This is about us doing our duty. And you have a duty in that as well. We all have a responsibility for that. There are many people here who have moved to this little town in southeastern Tennessee to be part of this congregation from across this nation from all the way on the other side of the continent, have come here because there was something that appealed to them. They, they felt like God was doing something here, and here they are. Well, if you still believe that, then you better know that you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to defend it. You're going to have to guard it. We're not going to sit around a campfire singing Kumbaya or whatever the messianic equivalent of Kumbaya is. We have a tool in one hand, and we have to pivot sometimes with the sword we have in the other. And so you had better be ready and willing to fight. And again, both hands tied behind your back, duct tape across your mouth, but on your knees, and not backing up. I want you to consider this. Here's why what I'm saying is important, not just for today, but for the future. Because of the condition of their hearts, because Moses delayed, didn't come back when they thought he would, because things didn't happen the way they thought they should, when, how, and all those things. Well, I think it could be done this way, and he should have done this, et cetera, et cetera. Many of God's people ended up worshiping the image of a beast. They ended up worshiping what they were familiar with. And so when Moses did return, here they were reveling and elevating this calf above God. Elevating their warm fuzzies or whatever it was above God. And perhaps in some perverted way, these people at the foot of the mountain thought they were honoring God. They very soon found out differently, did they? No, that doesn't work. Here's why I'm saying that, because Moses is a picture of the Messiah. He's gone away. And he's left his priests here with many responsibilities, one of them being restrain the people. Don't let them break out. Don't let them rise up. Be the voice that says, this is right, this is wrong. This is true, this is false. This is light, this is darkness. 
be those who restrain those who are trying to raise up and, and rebel. And so the Messiah will, like Moses, come back. But we understand that the bridegroom delayed his coming. He didn't come back when the virgins thought he might. He delayed his coming. In fact, they all went to sleep. Remember the parable. But because he delays his coming, it's very possible that some of his servants will forget. Where's the promise of his coming? Since the father slept, everything's continued on as it's always been. And some will forget, and they'll begin to mingle holy with profane. They'll beat up on some of the other servants. And then one day he shows up when they weren't expecting him. And what I'm saying here is if we're not careful, we'll begin to behave in ways that are akin to what happened at the foot of Mount Sinai. And why did that happen? Because things didn't happen the way they thought they would, when they thought they should. And really, it's because there were things in their heart that really needed to be exposed. Now, got a few more thoughts with you. Luke 18, beginning at verse 1. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Let's set the context. That we always need to be praying and that we do not need to lose heart. Because when you lose heart, you go to Aaron and say, make us a God that will lead us. Let's do something. Let's make something happen. There was, a cert there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And so ladies, this is one time when that persistence that you have really pays off. <laughs> There's a word I'm avoiding like the plague here. <laughs> Filter. But no, that's what he's saying. This woman is continually coming to me. And you know what? She's wearing me out. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect? who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Here's the point, at least as it occurs to me. If an unjust judge will avenge the woman, will not the righteous judge avenge his own? If a wicked man will do this, will not the righteous one do even better? But what happens if things don't occur when they think it should? What if it doesn't happen how they thought it should happen? Because he's going to bear along with them. So will they hang on? Will they lose heart? When he comes, will he find faith on the earth? Or will he find his people dancing around a golden calf. I brought this up Wednesday night. I think it was Wednesday night. The word for faith, emunah, the first time we see that in all of Scripture is when Aaron and Hur are standing on either side of Moses as Israel is fighting Amalek, and Moses' hands would be raised and Israel would prevail. But when his arms got tired and he'd lower his arms, Amalek would prevail. And so Aaron and Hur come alongside, and they steadied Amunah. They steadied his arms to keep his arms in the air until Israel prevailed over their enemies. So when the Son of Man comes... Will he truly find steadiness, faith? Will he find us continuing and persevering though he bear with us long? Though he doesn't answer when we want, how we want, where we want, all of those. Will he find his people steadying themselves, being faithful to him 
Or will he find us dancing around a golden calf? Will he find us contending for his kingdom and doing our duty regardless of what it costs us in this life? Will he find us contending for his kingdom? Will he find that our actions match our words? You can say you're an apple tree all day long, but if lemons are growing on those limbs, you're not an apple tree. You can say I'm this, but if you're doing that, you're not this. You're that. And that's why Yeshua said you will know them by their fruit. So your actions need to match your words. And if they don't, there's something wrong. Elevating, lifting our heads, ketisa, was a way to count and to see Who's willing to fight for him? Who is prepared to resist the out of Rav and resist those who would quickly turn away? Who is going to be able to distinguish who's on the Lord's side from those who thought the Lord was on their side? Who is going to be able and have the diligence to restrain the rebellious nature that is within all of us? We all have that inclination within us to resist and to rebel against the word of God. It's this thing called flesh. It's this thing called carnality and desire. That that needs to be put to death so that the weight of his glory can truly fall upon us. And so then those who are committed to these things, Kitisa reminds us, if that's what we're about, to lift up our heads to him and be counted for that. Because we're going to lift up our heads to be counted as a soldier for one of two masters. And I know what happens to the other guy and his minions, and I don't want to be in that crowd. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Father, all I know to pray, Father, is that your will be done. Let your word be what resonates within our spirit. Help us, Father, to walk in the authority that you have invested in us and to be responsible to those things you've called us to be and to do. Always with an eye on you. Always walking in the spirit and not reverting to our flesh. Father, if there's anything in my heart and life that is unpleasing to you, I pray you'll forgive me. I humble myself before you. I humble myself before you and ask you if there's anything in my heart and life that is impure, unholy, unclean, that you would forgive me, that you would bring it to my attention, and that you would show me that I might overcome those things and then turn from those things. And I pray that every person in this room that's watching on this live stream would right now humble themselves before you and come to you and ask you to purge their hearts of anything that is unclean. Because we want to see your face. We want the weight of your glory to descend upon us. We want your presence. Because if you don't go with us, we don't want to go. Father, let your will be done in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. Um, I'm going to go to prayer request. I had one quick little thing that popped in my mind when Bill brought up the scripture about Psalm 83, about how the enemies make a tumult. I thought of the coyotes on our land that sometimes we'll hear them in the evenings just going crazy. And they sound like just this tumultuous murder taking place out there. And especially if they have some prey, it's even worse. And it's just a, a cacophony for you musicians who know what that means. It's, it's um, this uproarious, unorganized, scary sound. And, and wolves make it too. Um, so when I was, actually, I was thinking about this earlier in the week, and this just kind of, when he said that, it popped back into my mind this morning. When the father reminded me in a song that I was singing earlier this week, um, do you know what chases away wolves and coyotes? A lion. The lion. We'll just leave that right there. 
So um, I don't have a lot of prayer requests. I do have um, the fact that we are able to have the Losey family with us here today as a huge praise report. I know Robert is, um, at, I think he's at home convalescing unless he slipped in, but uh, just keep all of them in prayer. Uh, Robert and Nayla and Zuriel. Also, um, another member of their family was in the hospital at the same time for a different reason, so we'd like to keep her in prayer. And then Robert also requested prayer for his cousin, um, David Scott, who has some issues that he needs to be healed from. Um, so if, if you will, keep those people in prayer. I know there are a lot of others. There are plenty on the uh, prayer app. There are plenty, plenty who have... Uh, submitted their request um, here in the house and have written in by email or whatever. Those are received. We do distribute those to the prayer team. Uh, Marlene makes sure that those are very well covered in prayer during the week. So here in the house and those of you on live stream who send those in as well, you're covered, believe me. So without further ado, let's just stand and go to the Father. I know you all have your own prayer request. I always have not just one, but a bunch of them. So as we pray, that request that you have, and if you don't have one of your own, you surely have one that you know of for somebody else that you can address. So let's take it to the king. If you will, just pray with me. Oh, merciful king, you are so long-suffering, so kind and so patient, oh, so gracious to us, none of which we deserve our king. Yet you love us, and you pour out on us, and you don't give up on us. And I thank you for that, Father. Father, I thank you for this word that you breathed on us today. I know it came straight from the breath that is in your lungs. And I thank you for that. I thank you for the reminders that you gave us in it. Abba, we are reminded that you are truly king of kings, and that is in every single situation, no matter what it is. War and peace, Father. Love and hate. Anything, Father. You are the king. You are in control. And so these things that we bring before you today, Father, physical healings, emotional and spiritual healings, Father, relational healings, you're Lord over it all. And none of it has taken you by surprise. The grossest of transgressions does not take you by surprise. And Father, I know in my heart, there's not one thing that if a person came back to you and said, I repent, I am sorry, I want to turn from my ways, I want to make it right, and I want to be the person you created to me, I want to be Tove, that you would not turn them down. Let today be that day, Father. All can be forgiven. Father, just move on hearts to want that more than life itself and to seek it, Father, to do the work. And Father, let those people know there's an army here willing and ready to stand with them to help them march forward in your will and your way. Father, that goes not just for spiritual things, but it goes for the physical things too. That we're here to help in any way that we can. And the first way we can help, Father, is to lift them up before you and ask you to remember them, to move on their behalf, Father, that they would be healed. I thank you for that shield of protection you put around the low seas yesterday, Father. Thank you so much. I thank you for the shield you put around those that were in the path of the tornadoes last week, Father. You're in control. Even when the enemy thinks he is, Father, he's not. You are in control. And I thank you for your protection. I thank you for your healing. I thank you that we can come to you and ask and know that you are already on it. Because he who watches Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. And we thank you for that. What peace we have in that. Thank you, my king. How can we ever thank you enough? Let us in some way, Father, this day show you a, a, an expression of our love, our gratitude for the things that you have done for us, Father, that you've already done, the things that we'll never know that you have done for us, Father. 
things that you're doing right now for us, things that you're already in the future doing for us. Thank you for it, Father. We just bless you. There are no words powerful enough to express our gratitude for you and the magnitude of your love for us. Thank you for connecting those two through your precious Messiah. It's in his name that we come and bring all things before you. We bless you for it. Amen. Amen. So while you're standing, those who have prepared and those who have a willing heart, we want to invite you to come and present an offering unto the Lord. If you're online, if you want to participate in this, we want to invite you to do that at this time as well. If you have little ones in the nursery, <laughs> go get them. In fact, I think we have a, they're not here, but we have a new baby in the congregation. Jack and Christina Nichols, their son was born yesterday. What was it, nine pounds, two ounces? Big boy. All right, and his name was Forrest, so run, Forrest, run. Well, we want to congratulate them, so that's great. Matt, Christina, she has big babies. Did, you, did anybody see Noah when he was a little guy? He was the Stay Puff Marshmallow guy. I mean, he was a big boy, cute as he can be. All right, yeah. Now, what are we supposed to do now? That's what you put the list there? So I'm going to greet the visitors now. <laughs> Bless his, at least he's purdy. <laughs> oh, Linda says because he has on the wrong shoes today. <laughs> if you were there, you know. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, let's do welcome the in-house visitors today. And our online visitors, you know, we don't do that. If this is your first time visiting online, we welcome you too. We wish you could be here to participate in the reception we're going to have afterwards, but it's a long commute. So just know that you're loved and appreciated. We're glad that you're here. But our first time visitors here in the house, please raise your hand. And if online you'd like to raise your hand, you can. <laughs> raise your hand. Okay, some over here, some right here, here, and another one over here. Okay. Very good. Well, family, you see who they are, so help them out today. If they have questions or um, need help getting somewhere, just let them know. And we want to let you know that briefly, immediately after we dismiss, we will go out into the foyer where you came in today and have just a very brief reception, a few refreshments. We just want to shake your hand, say hello. Um, we won't keep you long because we know you're hungry. And um, if we'll come and do that with us right after and those of you the rest of you have anything that you'd like to discuss with bill or me if you would just kindly hold that until after we have a chance to greet the visitors so that we're not holding them too long and the staff who joins us to greet them now uh, we also want to um, greet our online family so you know the drill turn around which camera are we looking at okay number two with the red light on it so say hi they can hear you shabbat shalom We're so glad that you join us every week. You're a big part of our family, and I'm so happy to get to wave to you. And I met some of you just last week that are, uh, are actually Monday night that are in West Virginia that I'm waving at you now too. family with, uh, I think, 10 children who came. They drove all day to get there seven hours, stayed for the pour in play, turned around and drove back after the play that night. So he could go to his job on the night shift. So... I mean, if you think your commute across town or from the next town was bad, I want you to talk to these folks with 10 children in tow. So, so anyway, I said that to say I'm happy to know some of the faces of the live streamers. I get to meet them. So I see you when we're waving. Um, oh, it's time for the blessing. That's why you have those notes there. <laughs> uh, but at least she's pretty.
Yes, and she has the right shoes, she says. All right, so I'm assuming that I, I, I got the thumbs up back there. So let's just all continue to stand and receive the blessing. Okay, so uh, I believe, is it Reuben that's meeting today? Yes, with the hoods over here on this side. If you're in the tribe of Reuben, um, your lunch gathering is going to be down here by the windows today. Um, again, if you can't navigate the stairs, there'll be tables in the corner. Downstairs here, going up to eat over here on this side, going down or out of the building over on this side. If you're exiting and not going upstairs, if you'll use these doors, it helps with the flow of traffic. So if you'll just keep that in mind. Um, we will also have prayer going on in this corner over here for those who need prayer afterwards. So just please keep that in mind as you exit. Um, and that as you're walking out, that you would just keep the chatter you know, to res a respectable level over here while they're praying. I knew something was wrong. Join me. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Puri HaGafen Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And for giving us Yeshua, the Messiah, who said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. L'chaim. Oh, my goodness. Who fixed this? Tate? Son. What bread? Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech 
העולם, המוציא לחם מן הארץ. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, and for giving us Yeshua, the Messiah, who said, I am the bread of life. And again, as always, yeah, I, I am going to take some. Absolutely, I'm going to take some. I'm going to take that right there. <laughs> In all seriousness, let's, let's all be reminded. None of us want to hear him say, I didn't know you. We all want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And so for that to happen, we have to know him. And so if you do not know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through his son, Yeshua, the Messiah, today is the day of salvation. Don't let this day pass before you set things right with the Father. Amen? Amen. Eve? Come here. Are you embarrassed? I'm sorry. I would never embarrass you, but I'm so glad to see you. She has been in Wyoming for a while, taking care of her son. And so, so glad to see you. Make sure you get, we get a hug later, okay? All right. All right. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and dismiss our first-time visitors. So if you will, please, just everybody else stay where you are. And if you're going to visit, that's fine. Just don't clog the aisles. And let's let our first-time visitors go ahead and go out into the foyer. And we'll meet you out there, Bill and I will, just briefly. We're going to give you just a couple minutes to exit here. And the rest of us are just going to wait for you to get out without getting all clogged up and tripped up and then after that we want our parents with young children to be prepared to